the Native American in the United States was not destroyed simply because they were surplus, you see. They were of little or no economic value to this country. And therefore, this country did not intend to feed what it called useless mouths. And therefore, it could live with, better live without them. And there is no capitalist system that's going to carry on the burden of millions of people. It will see you dead before it will see itself dragged into the ground. That 40 black folk in second banana jobs implies great advancement for Negro people in America? <laughs> will even, what if, if we had black executives over all of the Fortune 500 companies? What does that mean within the context? of 40 million black folk. But you see, we got a bunch of people here who want to make you think that they're getting a job represents an advancement for the race. The greatest measure of advancement for the race is the movement of average people into jobs. Not the movement of a small elite. But what is it doing for the average person? It is an insult in this system anyway that an eighth grade or ninth grade educated person can't get a good job. See, we accept this as, as, as written. The idea that if you got an eighth grade education, ninth grade education, you're supposed to starve to death. Where is that written in, 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 in concrete? What kind of nation is it that uh, will we, we'll project this kind of mythology that simply because you don't finish high school or simply because you only finish high school you're supposed to uh, work for a, 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 a poverty wage. But we've sort of bought in to this concept and this idea. Now let's look quickly here then at the number of black folk who are making $50,000 and above. You know, that would include these great executives, right? You know what percentage of black people earn $50,000 and over? 15% of the black population. Only 15% of this 40 million people. 14 earn between thirty-five dollars and $50,000, 14%. 14% earn between 25 and 30, 5,000. 18 between 15 and 20, uh, 5,000. 11 between 10 and 14 and 15,000. And 15% between 5 and 9,000. No, 15% of the people are below the official poverty line, with 11% making under 5,000 a year. So we must look at progress in terms of where the average person, where these people uh, between, let's say, 25,000 and below moving. And are those people moving? Not this small percentage that may be getting above $50,000 a year. Be very careful. J.C. Smith, uh, an author, made the following statement, the most efficient way to maintain power is to give a little where it shows a lot. Thus the system only remo uh, removes some of the most obvious forms of exploitation and abuse. What are we talking about here? We're talking about tokenism. In other words, this nation can get a lot of mileage out of, a, out of appointing 40 executives uh, positions to high profile positions in its industrial structure and have black people then to see the appointment of these 40 people as representing progress for the whole race. This is what we mean by, by saying what, uh, give a little where it shows a lot. Okay, we'll give you a few positions and they are high profile positions and therefore you're overwhelmed by people being in this position and you, you're fed with the false hope then that these positions and all the other positions that we don't have are now open and available to us as a people. You must recognize in my last reading that there are something like 17 million 
businesses in America. And to have 40 executives or even 500 executives, black executives, or to have 5,000 black executives is almost an unmeasurable number in, 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 in among 17 million businesses. And if at last count, if, if my memory served me, there's something like 77,000 black businesses. So again, you can realize the tremendous economic gap between, uh, between black folk and so-called white folk and other folk in this system. However, the appointing of these black executives in these high profile positions helps to deceive us and helps us buy into the ideology of individualism. The idea is that these black executives are in these positions because they study hard at night and because they came from the right families and because their mothers supported them, another kind of stupidity that we hear day in and day out. And therefore, we would not question the class structure of this system. We will not question the ethnic structure of the system. We will not structure the nature of power relations. We will not structure the intentions of Europeans to continue to maintain control over our lives. What the European has done essentially then is to blind us to the reality that their control over our lives and their control over the world is as strong, if not stronger, as it ever was by appointing a few, few black people in high profile positions. And to feed the rest of us with vain hopes that we one day will be among those few appointees. And to therefore deceive us into supporting the ideology of individualism, each one doing his own thing, that we do not have to operate as a race and as a collective group. And we do not have to operate on the basis of a common African identity, that we do not have to operate on the basis of a nation within a nation and as a people against other people, that all we have to do is pursue our own individual interests and we will therefore make it. This is a major deception. It is very important that we face the reality of America today and face the reality of the world today. More so than that, it is very important that we face the reality of our own situation as African Americans. I've talked in other arenas about what I call the crisis of white supremacy. One of the reasons we don't worry too much as an African people, even when we are doing badly, and even when I'm talking the way I'm talking today, is it is very difficult for many African people to perceive the white man as not being in control of the world. Yeah. You know, we are so, we've seen so many movies where white boys win all the time. We've seen so many sitcoms where in 30 minutes a white boy figures out a way to save the day. We've seen so many white supermen and spider-men and all these other kinds of men who are able to save uh, Gotham from, <laughs> from criminals and stuff until we have been subliminally indoctrinated with the idea that white folk will always be on top. Many of us do not recognize that white folk have not, will not always be on top and, not have, and, and have not always been on top. That the white man on the so-called top has only been there for about 500 years out of the millions of years man has existed on this globe. And that the black man has been on top for thousands of years longer than the white man will ever know. But for people who don't know their own history, and for people who don't read history, for people who get that knowledge from cartoons and from sitcoms and from TV, you will never be aware of this. And so there are those among us, particularly those who live in America, who believe that since we live among the top white folk in the world, they will always stay on top and they will always hand us a crust of bread. There will always be welfare. 
And yet Clinton today is telling you that he's going to sweep you off of welfare after two years on it. And that one of the major programs that the Republicans are crying out for and other people are crying out for, for cutting, are those are welfare programs. If you look at some of the states across this country, such as California, Michigan, and other states, you will see welfare programs and other what we call government transfer programs, where money is transferred from the government to people in poverty, they have been declining over the past uh, decade or so. Poor people are getting poorer in America, not better. As a matter of fact, we have as many, if not more now, poor people in America as we had in, uh, in the early 1970s. Poverty has actually increased and is, is increasing to the point uh, of uh, where we uh, initiated a war on poverty at the end in the middle 1960s. When you look at the number of African-American children in poverty, the number of African-American children who live in poverty today is the same as the number that lived in poverty in 1949. Okay? And this is what you have to measure sometimes, by the way, when you look at statistics. Because some people want to say, well, you know, two-thirds of black folk are in the middle class. And three-fourths, uh, uh, three-quarters of black men are uh, 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 above the the poverty level in earnings. But that's not the most important measure of where we are as African people. What you have to look at in terms of where you are as an African people are the number of children who are in poverty. You see, what number of children live in poverty-stricken circumstances? And when you live in poverty-stricken circumstances, you are not just living in an area where there is an absence of money. You're living in an area where there are absences all about you. You generally then will live in areas where there is a high level of criminality, high levels of drug addiction, high levels of prostitution and other things going on, poor educational opportunities, poor job opportunities, poor health uh, uh, care and other kinds of things. So when we say people are poor, we are not talking about people who just are lacking money. We're talking about people who are living under particular conditions that destroy the spirit, destroy the mind, destroy values, destroy outlooks, and continues to perpetuate poverty through the type of, of the psychology that is ultimately inculcated in those people. And therefore, the more sensitive measure of the nature of where we are as a people are the number of our children who are living in poverty-stricken circumstances. So while we may talk about a third or two-thirds of our people living above the so-called poverty line, we must recognize that almost two-thirds of our children are living under poverty-stricken circumstances, and that does not augur well for the race. Simply because you have something does not mean that you will keep it. And this is another error that many black people make. They think now because they got good jobs, or you think now because you may be living better, that the world, that this is going to continue. There's no universal law written in stone that because you're living well today, you're going to live better tomorrow. I frequently criticize this myth in America, this myth that we call the myth of progress, or the idea of progress. That that is that things get better with time so that uh, even if they're not the way we want them today, they will be better tomorrow. Who told you that lie? They could be worse tomorrow. People don't only progress in history, they regress in history. Empires not only are built and grow up in histories, empires do what? Fall and collapse in histories. You must understand that. So simply because you may have a higher level of opportunity today, simply because you may have a higher income today, in no way guarantees greater opportunity tomorrow or higher income tomorrow. So there are those who will look at this so-called progress that African Americans have achieved today and will assume then that this expansion will continue in the future. And yet a reading of our own history would demonstrate that that is not the case. This is not the first time black people voted. This is not the first time black people have gone to so-called integrated school. This is not the first time in the history of African Americans that you had black mayors, that you've had black people sitting in the Congress.
Congress of the United States, that you've had black people sitting in the Senate of the United States, that you've had black people head of cor corporations or living in white neighborhoods. You know the time that this occurred in this country? This same type of lifestyle occurred in the United States over 100 years ago in the 1870s. Back in the 1870s, black people were expecting to have a black president, a vice president elected any time. You had black people in the 1870s proclaiming that the era of racism was over, that people would no longer be judged based on their race or background in the 1870s. But do you know what happened in the 1870s? Blacks were disenfranchised. The votes were taken away. Black people were thrown physically out of state legislatures. Black people were terrorized from the voting polls and were not allowed to vote. Black people who had been buried in graveyards beside white folks, they had their bodies dug up and shipped somewhere else. In other words, you see, because you are integrated doesn't mean you cannot become disintegrated. And, 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 and it took then 100 years, up to the 1960s and 70s, for black people to reachieve again the things they had 100 years before. So there is no guarantee that because you have some kind of opportunities today, or because you're making some kind of progress today, that that progress is guaranteed to you. Why were black people rejected and why were they disenfranchised? Because a group of white folk thought that it was in their interest that they be disenfranchised. And we are in exactly the same position today. When there is a group of white folk in America today who come to believe seriously that it is in their interest to remove opportunities from black folk and to disenfranchise us, then it will happen. And ladies and gentlemen, it is on the verge of happening today. And we have to then keep this in mind. Why is this happening today? For one of the major reasons, it happened in the 1870s. Because in the 1870s, a part of the struggle also had to do with the economic nature of America, and America undergoing recession and America undergoing depression, and America undergoing uh, economic problems. And therefore, there was a need to readjust the racial status quo. And black people then were a part of that readjustment. White, we believe then, and this is what I was talking about earlier, we think then that whites will always be on top, and therefore, their being on top is going to at least guarantee that we eat. That is a serious deception. I've talked before about the crisis of white supremacy. The fact now that there is a question as to whether whites will be the supreme race on this globe. There is beginning to be every likelihood that the Asian ethnic group will be the supreme ruling group on this globe particularly if Africans are still listening to hip hop and still caught up in music and are still not caught up with the realities of what's going on. And I've often asked the question then, are we as African people uh, struggling to gain our freedom from white domination only to fall under the domination of Asians? And that possibility is becoming more and more real today. There is no universal law that guarantees that white folks shall always win today, that they will always be on top, and therefore African people should be aware of the fact that we can no longer depend upon white prosperity and depend upon white domination to provide us with second banana existences or existences at all. Now if you read this years, the state of black America, 1993, put out by the Urban League. And I urge people to read this particular publication, which is bulging with statistics. I think it will sober you up to a great, very great extent. But let's again look for a moment at the nature of the American economy in terms of jobs, since we are being educated to get jobs, aren't we? 
New York Times, February 28, 1993. Clinton plan confounds union chiefs. The headline reads, wanted, high tech jobs for retrained workers. <laughs> In other words, you're retraining workers for jobs, but what? Where are the jobs? And it starts by saying, what American workers need are a lot more high-wage, high-skilled, quality jobs, as President Clinton called them last week. Find those jobs and train people to do them, and the government, the schools, industry, and labor unions will build a prosperous middle class and the mighty American economy of the 21st century. We need an aggressive attempt to create high-tech jobs of the future, the president said. That was just a thematic salvo to the jobs plan that the administration will eventually put together. But the planners might have to do some heavy thinking about one dimension, just what are those high-tech jobs? What are they? Where are they? Where are those jobs waiting for you simply because you got an education? They go in and ask other questions. What jobs are you going to train people for? This is America. These are the questions that America is asking itself. What kind of jobs are we going to train our people for? But this job is being, this question is being asked in Germany. It's being asked in, in, in England. It's being asked in, in, uh, in France. It's being asked across the European diaspora as well. It's being asked in Russia, in Eastern Europe. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, white American uh, European capitalism is in a state of crisis and that means that African American people who are dependent upon the health of capitalism are also in a state of crisis. You've heard that phrase, when white folk get a cold, black folk get the flu, or are you going to really get the flu with this one? The other question is asked, uh, does Ron Carey, president of the Teamsters Union, know? No. He says, I would not know how that comes about. Giant corporations, giant companies like General Motors, IBM, United Technologies, Boeing, Eastman Kodak, and Sears, Roebuck, are still shedding workers. Many of them high wage, high, highly skilled machinists, tool makers, and sheet metal workers, accountants, supervisors, and systems engineers. So does that sound like a great uh, opportunity awaiting you? simply because you're qualified? Within one week, Sears Roebuck and these other companies, with one, one week, announced 100,000 layoffs. There's a hoax around this idea that this country is in dire need of skilled workers. How can it be in dire need of skilled workers when it is laying off skilled workers by the thousands. And not only is it laying off skilled workers by the thousands, it is laying off skilled managerial workers by the thousands, middle management people. You see those jobs that we as black folk used to talk about that, that set the glass ceiling beyond which we can't go? Well, those jobs also now are being eliminated. The unemployment in the managerial areas is shrinking not expanding. So then there's severe crisis. With GM and IBM boarding up factories, many of those jobs will never return. I try to warn my people that America is going through a major restructuring in its economic system. We are not just suffering from some kind of recovery after which it is over, we'll return to the jobs from which we were laid off. These jobs from which we are being laid off are disappearing, never to come back again. You have now in this country a recovery that is occurring, but not creating new jobs. And this is a part of the problem. So you can now have an increase in business activity, yet that increase does not mean an increase in job opportunities. And what does that imply then? It implies either that more people are working overtime that are already there, but on a more ominous level, it implies that while people were being laid off, their jobs were being restructured 
are phased out and being replaced by computerized um, activities or the nation's corporations are completely reorganizing themselves so that they will not need as many workers in the future. The country, the companies in this country now are shipping jobs out of the country period. They are de-industrializing this nation, which means that they whole factories are being just taken wholesale out of this country and being planted in other nations across the world. Which means then that the good old factory jobs that used to pay well are no longer there. That is why black people are suffering in Detroit, suffering in the in the Midwest, suffering in the Northeast to a degree that they've never suffered before because these areas used to be the chief industrial areas of this country. Now, these areas are being stripped of their industrial base and the industries are being shipped out to other nations. And you got people now who are working for $4 a day on a job that we used to work for at 10, 20, and $30 an hour. And therefore, the, the corporations are no longer interested in hiring people who are demanding 15, 20, 30 dollars an hour when they can take these jobs right down to Mexico and have the Mexicans and others work for three, four, five dollars a day, ladies and gentlemen. This is the nature of what's going on in the world. They're no longer that interested either in developing computer technologists when they can hire a computer a technologist in Ireland or in, in some other part of the world with their computer hooked directly into a main terminal in the United States so that information can be put directly into that computer outside of the country and, and, and communicated directly to computers here. Why then hire an American worker at $10, $15 an hour to run a computer when you can hire a, a, a computer operator uh, overseas for the same price? You see, this communications revolution has drastically restructured the system. It means then that a computer operator in Ireland or some other part of the world can communicate as rapidly with you in America as you can communicate with someone downtown. As a matter of fact, when you call up now to get an airline reservation and so forth, you may be talking to someone uh, in Jamaica or talking to someone in some other island somewhere and thinking that you're talking to them right here in the country. It has gotten to the point now where it is cheaper to employ people halfway around the world, ship the stuff back over here, than it is to make the stuff right here in America. I am in publishing. We send our books out to get printed. In actuality, it's cheaper now for us to send our books probably to Taiwan and have them printed there and shipped back to the United States than to have them printed in the country, say like in Michigan, and have a truck drive them to New York City. This is the kind of thing that's going on here. This is not just an ordinary recession. This is a major restructuring of the world. And if African people do not wake up and understand what is going on, we are going to be surplus people. And this country has a, re a, a very clear record of what it does with surplus people. It does not feed them welfare. It does not give them handout, it kills them. Read the history of the Native American. The Native American in the United States was not destroyed simply because they were surplus, you see. They were of little or no economic value to this country. And therefore, this country did not intend to be what it called useless mouths. And therefore, it could live with, better live without them. And there is no capitalist system that's going to carry on the burden of millions of people. It will see you dead before it will see itself dragged into the ground. White folk are not going to see a decline in their power or a decline in their dominance because they're taking care of black folk. I want you to make that very clear. If they have to make a choice, between being number one in the world and top dog in the world and carrying a bunch of black folk on their back. There's no choice at all. The decision is already made in the question. They're going to rid themselves of you like any other people in their right minds will do. <laughs> so, let's continue. 
you got to face the hard reality. It's only a brainwashed Negro that will sacrifice himself to other people. But what, and it goes on, but what many skilled workers are getting now are low wage, low skilled, lousy jobs. In the view of people at the union executive council meeting here, the middle class that emerged in the bustling economy of the 50s and 60s is sliding into the ranks of the working poor. The skilled two worker, two job family with generous health and uh, pension benefits is becoming the unskilled two worker, two, three, and four part time job family without without benefits. And it goes on. But let's look at the African situation right quickly, as depicted by the Urban League, as they look uh, at the nature of what is happening in America. This article is titled, African Americans in the 21st Century Labor Market. We're speaking now of the 21st Century, Improving the Fit by Biddy, uh, Billy J. Uh, Tidwell. He writes here that the implications of these trends, the kind of trends that I've just mentioned, along with others, are at once promising and perilous. Referring to African people, on one hand, the changing demography of the labor force may combine with the mountain centrality of human resources to expand opportunity for the group. What he's saying here is, due to the fact that white folks and their population is not growing at such a high rate, and that in the 21st century, there will be more non-whites in America than whites, that may mean an opportunity for white folks, since they may have to hire more white folks to continue to run the country than they did in the past. But that is based on an assumption. And we've already talked about how this assumption can be not true. Simply because there, there will be more black folk and more Latinos and so forth than whites does not necessarily mean that the opportunity structure will open up for us. It may mean, as I mentioned earlier, that the country will simply ship in more immigrants, you see, to take the jobs. Or, as what we will ship out the jobs, you see, and just give the jobs to other ethnic groups in other nations and in other places. So you can't sit back and say, well, we're, we're going to be the majority in the 21st century, and there are going to be more people of color in America than uh, there will be white folk. So America would have to hire us because there ain't enough white folk to run the place. Yeah. Okay. You can see that if you wish. America's already demonstrating that he could move those jobs around and move those industries around in other places. Not only is it moving the industrial jobs around, it is moving the brain jobs around, the engineering jobs, the research jobs, the scientific jobs. This country now is beginning to get its major research and developmental work being done by Indians in India, by people in uh, what Malaysia, because these people produce a much higher level of engineers and others than even American whites are producing, and particularly American blacks are producing. Many major American corporations now are beginning to ship even their headquarters into other countries. Okay, so not even the major headquarters will be located in the United States. So there are tremendous changes going on, and these changes uh, point to great dangers. He goes on to say, on the other hand, as intimated, the contemporary labor market is much different from that which existed during the heyday of industrialism, when one pursuit, one's pursuit of economic well-being was well served by physical muscle. In the new era, intellectual muscle, that is the ability to think analytically, compute, comprehend instructions, make decisions, communicate clearly, interact effectively in group endeavor is the ticket to prosperity. In this connection, there continues to be an unsettling lack of conversion, that is, of a coming together between where black folk are and where we need to be, in a, in a, a bad fit between the overall conditions of African Americans and the human capital that the change in economies, that the change in the economy needs. In other words, we're not in the right place. One writer has made this point in stark, poignant terms. Black Americans have outlived their usefulness. Their raison d'etre, that is their usefulness, their reason for being, 
to this society has ceased to be a compelling issue. Once an economic asset, they are now considered an economic drag. The wood is all hewn, the water all drawn, the cotton all picked, and the rails reach from coast to coast. The ditches are all dug and the dishes are all put away, and only a few shoes remain to be shined. Okay, so people are very clear about where we are. He goes on to say at the same time, the analysis leaves no doubt that African Americans must be much more astute and proactive on behalf of their own development and participation in the economic mainstream. Jacob, who heads the Urban Leagues, made this statement. African American children must be trained to see and seize opportunity in the chaos of the changing domestic marketplace. We must develop a new mindset. In the light of time, I, I won't go through some of the other things they indicate here to point to the nature of what is going on in this, uh, in this economy. I just want to read just a couple of other things because I really want you to seriously look at, um, look at this situation here. What does the industrial restructuring portend for African Americans in the future? The prospects are less than sanguine. I mean, less than disturbed, they're, they're quite disturbing. African Americans continue to be greatly dependent on the manufacturing sector, accounting for more than 10% of all manufacturing workers in 1991. Hence, there is a bad fit between the current distribution of the African American workforce and the config reconfiguring industrial base. In other words, African Americans, in terms of where we are in the labor force today, we are in the very areas that will be strengthened uh, strength to the greatest degree tomorrow. We are all almost sitting in the wrong position to take advantage of the nature of the, the uh, restructuring of this economy. We're sitting in the kind of jobs and being trained for the kind of jobs that we or, or very few of which will exist in the future. In any event, the restructuring of the, econ restructuring of the economy's industrial base has brought disproportionate hardship to the African-American workforce. Under present conditions, there is little reason to expect this circumstance to improve. The parallel pattern of occupational changes could have even, could have even more ominous implications for our people. So here we are. We are in a very serious uh, pass as a people. We'll just quote you one more. Uh, after looking at the kinds of jobs that are projected to be more plentiful between the years uh, 1990 and the year 2005, again, the fit is not very good. Talking about our people again. African Americans are greatly underrepresented in the fastest growing occupations and overrepresented by those having the slowest projected growth. For example, in 1991, African Americans accounted for just 9% of the employed workforce in the front-running technical and related support occupations, which are expanding at a 37% rate. By contrast, African, the African American share of the shrinking operators, fabricators, and laborers group has nearly four times the minimum 4% growth rate for these occupations. And uh, so again, we are we in the wrong place at the wrong time. In short, the shifting occupational structure does not bode well for the economic future of African Americans. Both their current placement in the labor market and their relative position on the hierarchy of educational attainment are major constraints. Relieving these constraints, that is improving the fit, is essential to the overall economic well-being of the African American community in the years ahead. But the challenge may be more complicated than that. And so we are facing the possibility that even this may not change our situation as a people. So what is the function of education? 
Is the function of education to get you jobs that don't exist? Or is the function of education a bit more deep than mere job training? Is it a bit more deep than operating on the assumption that the economy will just continue to expand and that there are jobs out there waiting for the educated and the highly skilled and all you got to do is reach out and the apple will just drop in your hand? What is education about? You see, the major function of education, of course, is something that all groups of people have recognized. And groups of people who saw themselves as people and saw themselves as nations. And that is the basic function of education is to secure the survival of a people. To maintain their very biological existence and to enhance their quality of life. Education is not just about an individualistic preparation of some people for jobs. Ultimately, it must be the preparation of the people as a whole to maintain their existence, of which maintaining jobs and employment is a part of this major uh, need. But it does not define it totally, you see. When you see the United States in its struggle against the Japanese and how they were maintaining their, their, their supremacy in the world, how they were maintaining their economic position in the world relative to the Japanese. You see them examining the nature of American education. They're not examining the nature of African American education as much as they're examining the nature of white folks' education because they see that the education of their children and of themselves is crucial to their very survival and that it is not merely designed to get one or two people a job, but ultimately it's designed to maintain the very life of the group itself. We as African people then must measure our education and how good our education is or how bad it is in terms of the degree to which it contributes to us maintaining our very biological existence and to the degree to which our educated people contribute to enhancing the quality of life of ourselves as a people. Not whether one or two Negroes struggle to the top and then try to project themselves as some kind of role models for the rest. Ultimately, then, African people must take responsibility for their own education and must define education in terms of our own interests as a people. Education, by the very role it plays in the life of a people, must play, must then, in the life of African people, be an African-centered education. The Japanese are not being educated for black folk. The white folk are not being educated for, for black folk. There's no group of people on this earth being educated to see to the interests of black folk. There's no people who are in their right mind being educated to see to the interests of other people and to serve the needs of other people. Folk who know that they are folk, folk and people who know that they are people, people who know what their identity is, are operating in their own interests. And it will continue to be that way. And people who are on top in the world, people who are in control of their economic and political circumstances, people who are major players in the world, are people who take responsibility for their own education and for the education of their own children. You do not see any group of people who are on top in the world, any group of people who are creating a life for themselves, placing the education of their children in the hands of someone else. The Native American in the United States was not destroyed simply because they were surplus, you see. They were of little or no economic value to this country. And therefore, this country did not intend to be what it called useless mouths. And therefore, it could live with, better live without them. And there is no capitalist system that's going to carry on the burden 
of millions of people. It will see you dead before it will see itself dragged into the ground.